Nahum chapter 2. Nahum 2 describes the destruction of the destroyers using some of the most vivid images of ancient warfare ever written. And as we start today with Nahum, I'm going to actually read all of chapter 2. It's only 13 verses. So I'm going to read the whole thing so we have an idea of what we're getting into. And then we'll start our verse by verse, line by line, or even word by word analysis of the chapter. So Nahum chapter 2, starting with verse 1. One who scatters is coming up against you. Man the fortifications, watch the road. Brace yourself, summon all your strength. For Yahweh will restore the majesty of Jacob, yes, the majesty of Israel, though ravagers have ravaged them and ruined their vine branches. The shields of his warriors are dyed red. The valiant men are dressed in scarlet. The fittings of the chariot flash like fire on the day of its battle preparations, and the spears are brandished. The chariots dash madly through the streets. They rush around in the plazas. They look like torches. They dart back and forth like lightning. He gives orders to his officers. They stumble as they advance. They race to its wall. The protective shield is set in place. The river gates are opened. The palace erodes away. Beauty is stripped. She is carried away. Her ladies-in-waiting moan like the sound of doves and beat their breasts. Nineveh has been like a pool of water from her first days, but they are fleeing. Stop, stop, they cry, but no one turns back. Plunder the silver, plunder the gold. There is no end to the treasure, an abundance of every precious thing. Desolation, decimation, devastation, hearts melt, knees tremble, insides churn, every face grows pale. Where is the lion's lair, or the feeding ground of the young lions? Where is the lion and lioness prowled, and the lion's cub with nothing to frighten them away? The lion mauled whatever its cubs needed, and strangled prey for its lionesses. It filled up its dens with the kill, and its lairs with mauled prey. Beware, I am against you. This is the declaration of Yahweh of armies. I will make your chariots go up in smoke, and the sword will devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the sound of your messengers will never be heard again. So that's Nahum chapter 2. So starting with verse 1, and I'll read that again. Nahum chapter 2 verse 1 says, One who scatters is coming up against you. Man the fortifications, watch the road, brace yourself, summon all your strength. And the focus of this battle is not simply historical Nineveh. This battle is cosmic in scope. We've mentioned that before when we were looking at chapter 1, how the language goes far beyond a historical Nineveh to a much broader, more cosmic, more supernatural um, interpretation. And there's nothing in the text that identifies the addressee as Nineveh at this point. And due to the feminine grammar, scholar John D.W. Watts believes the addressee may be Ishtar. And we'll discuss Watts' identification of Nineveh with Ishtar much more in verse 5 and following, as that's going to become a major focus of chapter 2 here. But we see, starting off, the scatterer. And this scatterer is Yahweh himself, the one who scatters, is Yahweh himself, and he has come to do battle. Yahweh as the scatterer appears throughout the Old Testament, and uh, I have a few examples here just so we can see this idea and trace it back all the way to the time of Moses in the book of Numbers. And as Israel was being led through the wilderness with the, by the pillar of the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, we read in chapter 10 of Numbers, verses 35 and 36, the blessing of Moses. And it says that whenever the ark set out, Moses would say, Arise, Yahweh, let your enemies be scattered, and those who hate you flee from your presence. When it came to rest, he would say, Return, Yahweh, to the countless thousands of Israel. Another example is Psalm 68, verse 2. It says, God arises, his enemies scatter, and those who hate him flee from his presence. Now, just as a side note here, in the Septuagint, the word for arises is the Greek word, Anistimai, 
And this is a word in the New Testament that's used for resurrection. So in the Septuagint, the idea here is God arises or uh, resurrects. And it's the idea of rises from the dead. So the New Testament authors saw these types of verses. Psalm 82 is another one where this is used of the resurrection. It talks about God rising so the New Testament authors noticed these uh, this phrase these phrases in the Septuagint, and they picked them up to describe the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, when God rose from the dead, it was in the person of Christ, as Jesus is God incarnate. He rose from the dead, and after that, um, in the Psalm, it says that his enemies scatter, and those who hate him flee from his presence. So uh, these ideas have New Testament fulfillments as well. And then the most famous example of Yahweh scattering his enemies is at the Tower of Babel. And the Tower of Babel incident is when Yahweh scattered humanity over the face of the entire earth. And the Jewish rabbis Rashi and Kimhi believed that the scatterer in Nahum chapter 2 was directed against Judah. And there's actually some modern commentators that agree with this, but the majority believe that it's referring to Nineveh, that the scatterer is come against Nineveh. And I, myself, I agree with the Nineveh view uh, with also an eschatological overlay. So that's what I'll be presenting throughout the study. But I want to mention the view of the rabbis as we go because they do oftentimes have some interesting ideas. Another very interesting translation here is what the Septuagint does with Nahum 2 verse 1. And the Septuagint reads... He went up, breathing into your face, delivering from affliction. And the early church, which used the Septuagint, that was their Bible, they saw this verse in Nahum 2 verse 1, and they viewed this as a promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And Jerome connected this verse in Nahum with the breath of life from God in Genesis 2 verse 7. And as modern commentators study the early church writings, they believe that the Septuagint translators were drawing upon Ezekiel 37 verse 9. So when the Septuagint was working, the translators were working on uh, translating Nahum out of the Hebrew, the modern, the modern scholars that look at that believe they were drawing on Ezekiel 37 9, which says, he, which is God, said to me, and in the passage is Ezekiel, so God said to Ezekiel, prophesy to the breath Prophesy, son of man, say to it, this is what the Lord Yahweh says. Breath, come from the four, the four winds and breathe into these slain so that they may live. And this idea also links to John, 10, John 20, verses 21 and 22, which says, Jesus said to them, and the them here is the disciples. So Jesus saying to the disciples, peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. So by connecting the Septuagint of Nahum with these verses in Ezekiel and John, it's easy to see how the church fathers would interpret Nahum 2 verse 1 as a prophecy of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And this is another example of the differences of what we can learn from looking at the Septuagint um, and also is another example as to why I love the Septuagint, because of these, um, these insights that we can glean from the way that the, the scholars in the 2nd uh, the and 3rd centuries B.C., what they were looking at and what they were thinking as they were translating the Hebrew Scriptures. So verse 2, For Yahweh will restore the majesty of Jacob like the majesty of Israel, though ravagers have ravaged them and ruined their vine branches. So Jacob and Israel both are used here, the majesty of Jacob like the majesty of Israel. And that's a way of referring to all 12 tribes. So a few Old Testament verses where these are, uh, where both of these names are used for the entirety of the nation is Genesis 49 verse 2, where Jacob himself says, Assemble and listen, O sons of Jacob. Listen to Israel your father. And he's obviously there talking to all of his sons, which form the entire nation of Israel. Then Exodus 19 verse 3, it says, Yahweh called to him out of the mountain, 
And this is Moses. The Lord's calling Moses here. So, so Yahweh called to him out of the mountain saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel. So again, Jacob and Israel, when both are used, it's a way of referring to the entirety of the nation. So what we have here in Nahum, when it says Yahweh will restore the majesty of Jacob like the majesty of Israel, what we have here is a prophecy of the reunification of the nation. And the, uh, the church father Cyril is quoted as saying, quote, Jacob is the natural name which the people inherited from their forefather, and Israel the spiritual name which they had received from God, end quote. So by promising to restore the majesty of Jacob like the majesty of Israel, what's being communicated here is the Lord is saying the Jewish people will be restored to their special place of honor both nationally or physically, which is represented by the name Jacob, as well as spiritually, which is represented by the name Israel. So it's both, it's both physical national restoration as well as, well as spiritual uh, restoration as... Uh, the people of the Jewish people, the people of Israel, recognize, and there's a lot of prophecies to this effect, Zechariah um, and many others, when they'll, when they'll recognize Jesus as their Messiah and they will repent and they will be forgiven and restored. So Nahum here is ultimately prophesying that, which is yet in our future. And the verse also says there, ravagers have ravaged. Another way to translate it as emptiers have emptied. And when pronounced in Hebrew, these words make a gurgling sound like liquid being poured out of a bottle. So this again shows the skill of the poet as he's talking about emptiers emptying them. And when that's being spoken, it sounds like a liquid being emptied out of a bottle. A spronk. I've quoted him before in our previous studies, uh, Klaus Spronk. He believes that based on the tenses of the Hebrew, that the second half of this verse should be translated for destroyers shall destroy them and they shall ruin their branches. So this would be then a part of the prophecy of Nineveh's coming destruction rather than a statement of Israel's past destruction. But we also know that the Jewish people have had many ravagers come against them through the centuries. And there are yet more ravagers prophesied to come until the Lord returns and restores them ultimately. So uh, whether this is, whether it should be translated in the past tense, as most of the modern translations do it, or uh, a future tense like Dr. Spronk believes, um, either way, the prophecy still works uh, for Israel as being those ravaged. And it will also, as we'll see, work for uh, the Assyrians who are about to be ravaged and emptied out of their uh, capital city of Nineveh as well. So verse 3 and 4, Nahum chapter 2. The shields of his warriors are dyed red. The valiant men are dressed in scarlet. The fittings of the chariot flash like fire on the day of its battle preparations, and the spears are brandished. The chariots dash madly through the streets. They rush around in the plazas. They look like torches. They dart back and forth like lightning. So this is obviously uh, describing an army here. Um, and the army that's being described in the battle attire weapons and chariots is the army of the commanding officer who's attacking Nineveh. And some scholars see this as a description of the historical armies that came against Nineveh, which would have been the Babylonian armies. But other scholars conclude that it's the army of the divine warrior Yahweh in battle and not, not a historical army as such. But I, I think both of these can be true at the same time. I am going to be presenting uh, this mostly from the idea of the armies of Yahweh because to me that's just a lot more interesting. Um, we can read history books if you know when we're interested in the, the actual battles and things like that, but... Uh, to see the, the supernatural side of things, uh, we look at the scriptures, and I think that's just a lot more interesting. So I'm going to be mostly presenting it from that, from that point of view. But both of these are also true, and I have quotes from scholars on both sides of this that I'll be reading just to get an idea of it. So Dwayne Christensen here at this point, he says, quote, 
For the prophet, the armies engaged against the forces of Belial are the hosts of Yahweh, who appear as chariots of fire, running with the force of the storm and the, and the devastation of an earthquake. The forces of Yahweh work within the process of history. However, at the same time, they remain the armies of the great day of judgment, which will defeat the chaotic power of evil itself. The ambiguity in regard to the specific identification of the army is deliberate. The specific battle against the city of Nineveh takes place in history, but the poetic imagery used here has cosmic dimensions as the chaotic powers of evil are subdued in the wars of Yahweh." End quote. And as we've seen throughout our study of Nahum, Nahum's words speak of something much bigger than simply historical events. And it's the powers of the invisible supernatural forces of Yahweh that are ultimately in view here. And as we go, we'll also see the powers of, the, uh, of his opponents, the supernatural opponents of Yahweh, that will also be talked about in detail later. And there's some debate as to how to understand the language about the warriors and the valiant men in this verse. A scholar by the last name of Taylor and he's quoted in the other, by the other commentators, so I'm not sure what his first name is, but they quote uh, Taylor as translating this phrase, and let me get back up here really quick so I can read the phrase he's translating. So when it talks about the valiant men dressed in scarlet, and so Taylor translates that as the mighty men are gleaming. And the Septuagint right here reads, mighty men mocking in fire. Mighty men mocking in fire. And I have no idea what that means, but it has it definitely has a supernatural flavor to it. A gleaming and fire are both reminiscent of descriptions of divine beings throughout the scripture. Now I'm going to read an example out of Daniel chapter 10. Now exactly uh, which individual Daniel is seeing here is a, is a subject of scholarly debate and different teachers have different views. I'm not going to get into that, but just hear what Daniel says and how he describes this individual that he sees and uh, we'll see the immediate um, similarities to what Nahum says this army looks like. So Daniel 10 verse 6 says, His body was like beryl, his face like the brilliance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. So we see there the similarity of language from the Septuagint translation, um, what Taylor believes it should be translated, or how he personally translates it, uh, as well as even just the normal rendering of the passage. We see uh, torches, lightning, uh, fire, things like that. So the description of this divine being in Daniel has very much similar language to that. And the word that Nahum uses here in the Hebrew is the word gibberim, which is sometimes but not always used for giants. So, so in this field of study, a lot of the, a lot of people get will get excited and will um, want to see a giant everywhere the word gibberim is used, but it's not always used for gibberim, or not always used for giants, but it sometimes is. So we'll look at a couple examples here of when it is used for divine beings including the Septuagint, because they also at times will translate the word gibberim as gigantes or giants. So Psalm 103 verse 20, the angels are called gibberim. So that's obviously a supernatural application of the word gibberim. Uh, Genesis chapter 10, Nimrod is called a gibor. And if you look at the Septuagint of Genesis 10, it translates that as giant and says that Nimrod called, says Nimrod was a giant. So also Isaiah 13, verse 3, the gibberim are translated as giants in the Septuagint. And I'm going to read that passage, Isaiah chapter 13, verse 3 through 5, and then I'll also read verse 3 in the Septuagint. So the whole passage there, those three verses in our English translation of the Hebrew would say, I myself, and this is the Lord speaking, I myself have commanded my consecrated ones, and have summoned my mighty men to execute my anger, my proudly exulting ones. 
The sound of a tumult is on the mountains, as of a great multitude. The sound of an uproar of kingdoms, of nations gathering together. Yahweh of hosts is mustering a host for battle. They come from a distant land, from the end of the heavens. So Yahweh and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole earth. The Septuagint of Isaiah 13.3 says, I give command and, and I bring them. Giants are coming to fulfill my wrath, rejoicing at the same time and insulting. So we see there from the just the, the regular Hebrew text calling angels Gibberim or the Septuagint translating Gibberim as giants in multiple places, uh, we see that this word can have a supernatural meaning. And so its use here in Nahum may be, may be indicating that um, or indicating and or be further evidence that it's the uh, divine army of heaven that is in view. So Yahweh is here turning the arrogant boasting of the Assyrian kings back against them. And in order to really see that, we would need to be fam a little bit familiar with some of the words of the Assyrian kings. And I will have a few quotes from them throughout because the language that Nahum uses uh, is directly uh, referring back to things that the Assyrian kings said in their treaties or texts. And th there's an example of that here. So there's a vassal treaty of Esarhaddon, and Esarhaddon was one of the emperors, one of the kings of Assyria, and it contains this statement, quote, Just as this chariot is spattered with blood up to its running board, so may they spatter your chariots in the midst of your enemy with your own blood, end quote. So we see here the armies of Yahweh are preparing to pay back Nineveh in kind for how Nineveh treated its victims. And we'll see that idea repeat itself as the as Nahum's vision unfolds and we see the descriptions and we compare them to things the Assyrian kings claimed that they did to others. And Nahum's vivid description of the visual appearance of the army is mentioned in order to paint a picture of the atmosphere of violence and coming bloodshed. The imagery implies confusion and panic. But also the description of the chariots using fire and lightning language speaks, speaks of both their brightness and their speed. And it also gives the scene a heavenly feel. As we recall the chariots and horses of fire in 2 Kings chapter 2 and the chariots of fire that surrounded Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 6. So fire and lightning language for chariots uh, has direct connections to undoubtedly uh, divine chariot scenes in the book of 2 Kings. So Nahum 2 verse 5 says, He gives orders to his officers. They stumble as they advance. They race to its wall. The protective shield is set in place. The poetry is ambiguous here, and scholars believe this was intentional to reflect the confusion of battle. And the vagueness of the poetry also allows for multiple interpretations and meanings. So it starts off with, he gives orders to his officers, and the he here seems to be the commander of the forces inside of Nineveh. So the description has switched from the advancing armies outside of Nineveh in verses 3 and 4, to a view within Nineveh as they try to muster defense. The picture being painted by Nahum is of the hopeless attempt of those within Nineveh to mount a defense. And the unnamed individual who is, who's commanding the troops of the army against Yahweh may very well be Belial or his, com or his counselor, which we read about in chapter 1. We discussed uh, Belial and his counselor in chapter 1 of Nahum. But the ultimate fulfillment of this passage points to the armies of the beast and the false prophet in Revelation 19.19, 19, which says, uh, Then I saw, and of course this is John in Revelation 19 seeing this vision, he says, Then I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and against his army. This final battle is what's being foreshadowed in Nahum. And the word translated officers, and that's in the translation I read, other 
Uh, modern translations may refer to it as mighty ones or nobles. So he gives orders to his officers, mighty ones or nobles, depending on your translation. This can also have a divine connotation. This word is used in 1 Samuel 4 verse 8 in the phrase mighty gods. And the Hebrew term is adarim. And in the Ugaritic religion, the adarim reside on the threshing floor. And this is the same place to which the Rephaim arrive when they are invoked. And this word is also linked, Adarim, the word is also linked in a Phoenician inscription with Og, the last of the Rephaim. And in this Phoenician inscription, Og appears to be worshipped as an underworld deity. So this unnamed commander in Nahum 2 verse 5 is remembering his gods or perhaps his deified ancestors, but they aren't going to help him now. So when it says he, he gives orders to his officers... Another possible way of understanding that is um, instead of or giving orders, it could be the idea of remembering. Uh, some scholars translate it that way. He remembers his uh, officers or he remembers his uh, mighty ones, uh, something like that. So that could be what's in view here is the, the commander remembering his Adarim which would be either his gods or his deified ancestors, the Rephaim, which were worshipped, obviously, in this in this uh, in Nineveh. But either way, the, these beings are not going to help him now. And the uh, the end of the phrase, we're going to come back and talk about the wall because the um, actually the wall, the, when it says they race to the wall, the wall will be. An important uh, springboard for us to discuss some other things but I'm going to address the the protective shield that uh, it says at the very end of the verse the protective shield is a Hebrew word and then it's used of the guardian cherub in Ezekiel 28 verse 14 and 16 so based on that there's at least one scholar who believes the phrase here in Nahum is referring to the emblem of a god being raised in a hope that it will protect Nineveh so whether it's the gods themselves, the deified ancestors of the king, or of the emblems of their gods, none of these are or will be of any help against Yahweh and the armies of heaven. So now let's go back and discuss this phrase, they race to its wall. In Nahum chapter 2 verse 5, the walls are in the feminine in the Hebrew, and this leads... John D.W. Watts to suggest that Ishtar, the goddess of Nineveh, could be in view. And he believes that Ishtar is being referred to frequently throughout Nahum. Most scholars take the feminine language to speak of the city itself, but Watts believes it could also be referring to the goddess. He first mentions this in Nahum chapter 1 verse 8 and connects it to what we're looking at here in verse 5 through 7. And he says, quote, this feminine pronoun may stand for Nineveh, but it also may point to her patron goddess Ishtar, and even beyond Ishtar the, to the creator's great enemy who represents chaos in the creation epic. God's vengeance promises to end the enemy, whether on the level of history or on that above history. Those who stand with her as demonic allies are also God's enemies." End quote. Watts goes on to refer to these enemies as Belial, and then he says, quote, They are to be pursued into darkness. This is the darkness of the underworld, the world of death and demons where they belong, end quote. So I think Watts' um, uh, suggestion here is very interesting. I think it makes a lot of sense to identify Ishtar here with what's, with what's going on in Nahum chapter 2 and also chapter 3. I think it's pretty clear in chapter 3 that um, Ishtar is in view, and so it makes a lot of sense what Watts is saying here about Ishtar being the one referred to in verse in chapter 1, verse 8, and onward when we see this feminine grammar being used. So who is Ishtar? Ishtar was the most famous goddess of, of the Assyrian period. She's much more ancient than Assyria. Uh, worshipped in Mesopotamia. Ishtar is the goddess of sexual love as well as a war goddess. She is called the Queen of Heaven. She personifies the battle line. She's the patron, she's the patroness of prostitutes and is herself called a prostitute in some of the texts. 
and sacred prostitution involve temple priestesses of Ishtar having ritual sex with male visitors to the temple. And this is not this wasn't just done in Babylon and Assyria. But this is done uh, in the Greek and Roman period as well. Um, Paul talks to the Corinthians about this kind of thing when they were uh, involved in some things they ought not to have been. And scholars link Ishtar with Aphrodite, Aphrodite being the goddess of love. Um, they believe that um, Aphrodite was one of the later manifestations of Ishtar. And also Inanna was, um, was the manifestation of Ishtar uh, prior. So Inanna was the same or is the same as Ishtar. And according to Herodotus, going back to this idea of Ishtar as the patroness of the prostitutes, according to Herodotus, the Greek historian, every Babylonian woman was required at least once in her lifetime to attend the temple of Ishtar and agree to sex with any male that asked her. Ishtar is also the spouse and lover of the king with whom she participates in the ritual of sacred marriage. So sacred marriage is the act or the ritual in which the high priestess of Ishtar, or possibly Ishtar herself, we'll talk a little bit about that when we uh, in a second. So the high priestess of Ishtar, or possibly Ishtar herself, would have ritual sex with the king. It's believed that this ritual took place yearly during the Babylonian New Year's festival of Akitu. And the surviving royal hymns and inscriptions reporting the ritual refer in very explicit language to the passionate sexual affair between the king and the goddess Inanna, which as I mentioned is another name for Ishtar. Now, Ishtar also provides the king with economic blessings as well as power and victory in war. And in Assyria she was the goddess of war and victory. And she also seems to have been a gender fluid goddess. One hymn quotes Inanna slash Ishtar as saying, quote, when I sit in the alehouse I am a woman and I am an exuberant young man, end quote. And according to Gary Beckman, who's a noted Hittiteologist and professor of Hittite and Mesopotamian studies from the University of Michigan, the ambiguous gender identification was a characteristic not just of Ishtar herself, but of a category of deities that he calls Ishtar-type goddesses. Ishtar is also a goddess of sorcery, as we'll see when we get to Nahum chapter 3, verse 4. And at that point, we'll have to discuss this in more detail, as that's a directly links to Mystery Babylon, the great whore of Revelation 17 and 18. So there is a link between uh, Ishtar, the prostitute, the sorceress, and Mystery Babylon, the woman that rides the beast. But we'll look at that when we get to Nahum chapter 3 because that's when it's going to be uh, blatantly and clearly brought out by Nahum. So to end this little section here on Ishtar, I'm going to quote Watts again. He says, quote, She, speaking of Ishtar, was a most fitting symbol for the brutal empire. With lustful visions of riches and power, Ishtar had beguiled nations into war and conquest. Like the devil, she tempted and demonized all who came within her sphere of influence, end quote. And the description of the goddess sounds very much like the description of Nineveh itself, especially when we bring in what we're reading today with what we're going to see in chapter 3. The people of Assyria who worshipped Ishtar became like the goddess they worshipped, and they then received the same judgment. So uh, Nahum chapter 2 verse 6 says, The river gates opened and the palace erodes away. The palace erodes, dissolves, or melts away. This echoes the melting of the hills in chapter 1 verse 5. And this is flood using flood language. As the palace erodes away from the river, this is flood language. And this is another example of Nahum using the phrases that the Assyrian kings used of themselves, but he's using it against them. Because the Assyrian kings would at times describe themselves as unstoppable floods that wipe away their enemies. And here Yahweh turns the flood against them. Chaos is unleashed against them. According to the Greek historians, the Tigris River was diverted to flood the city. But however, the accuracy of the Greek historians on this point is questioned by modern scholars. They're not convinced that the Greek historians were quite correct in what they were saying, but that is what the Greek historians said about the fall of Nineveh. 
And J.J. and Roberts here says, quote, on a literal level, one can think of the flood water washing the palace away. On a metaphorical level, the language refers to the collapse of the will to resist, end quote. And again, Watts, J. J., uh, John D.W. Watts says, quote, this may be understood simply in military terms, but it may be that Nahum is here turning to the supernatural picture. The great cosmic waters are generally thought of as destructive powers. They had to be subdued and pushed back as part of creation. They were God's instrument of destruction in the great flood. In this case, the rivers are the currents of the great cosmic ocean, end quote. And Spronk also agrees with this as he links the rivers of chapter 2 here, chapter 2, verse 6, with the primordial flood as the powers of chaos breaks loose over Nineveh. But Spronk is also quick to add that the announcement in Nineveh should also be taken literally as a local repetition of the primordial flood. And this makes a lot of sense as it links back to the supernatural battle with sea and river that we spent time looking at in chapter 1, verse 4. And the promise that, quote, her place, which we read in chapter 1, would be swept away in an overwhelming flood. And if we remember that her links to Ishtar, so this is another aspect of the supernatural war being described by Nahum. This is also another intended uh, contrast between those who trust in Yahweh and those who don't. As we read in Isaiah 59, 19, it says, When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of Yahweh shall lift up a standard against them. And Isaiah 43, verse 2 says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. But those who trust in Nineveh and her gods will be swept away. So these verses in Isaiah... Uh, the, the idea of the enemy coming in like a flood, again, echoes the, the boasts of the Assyrian kings. But the Lord is quick to say that, that that's not going to uh, be the final word for his people because the spirit of Yahweh will lift up a standard against him, the enemy that comes like a flood. Which also could very well be uh, linked to Revelation when the dragon spews, out, uh, spews a river out of his mouth, but the the earth comes to the aid of the woman. At the end of this verse here, Nahum, um, verse 6, chapter 2, verse 6, speaks of the palace eroding. And the he to the Hebrew mind, the word translated palace in English means the temple, either earthly or heavenly. And the temple is the, is the palace of God as king. That's the idea. So there's another obvious contrast here, as God is on his throne in his temple palace, while the king of Assyria historically, or Ishtar supernaturally, or Belial eschatologically, have set themselves up on the throne in their own palaces, but these palaces melt at the arrival of Yahweh. Verse 7, Nahum 2.7 says, in this version, which I'm reading out of the CSB, it says, Beauty is stripped, she is carried away, her ladies in waiting moan like the sound of doves and beat their breasts. Now, nobody is sure how to translate this initial Hebrew word. So this translation, it says, Beauty is stripped. Um, there's a lot of different translation ideas, and they just are not sure. The Hebrew word is huzab, or huzab. So... One of the questions is, is this a proper name? And that's how the King James translators took it. If you read the King James, it'll just, it transliterates because they viewed it as a proper name. And they aren't the only ones. The Targum, as well as the Jewish commentators Rashi, Ibn Ezra, and Kimhi all believed it was the name of the Assyrian queen here, that Huzab was her name. And the church fathers believed that this word was intended as a figurative name for either Assyria or Nineveh. And many commentators believe it's referring to the goddess of Nineveh, usually Ishtar, but not always. Some of them have different ideas about that. And Watts here says, quote, This has sometimes been understood as a mysterious name for a god. Here it seems more likely to be something from the temple, perhaps the idol's pedestal. This would fittingly refer to Ishtar, whose temple had been destroyed, her image broken, and the base taken away. The slave girls or maidens are the sacred harlots, who were an important part of the Ishtar cult. Normally, they would dance in the temple. Now they are marched away with gestures of grief, end quote. 
So the conquered city's deity is paraded out of the city. That seems to be the idea. And there are a couple passages in Jeremiah that say the same thing. And the scholars note the many similarities between Nahum and Jeremiah and believe Nahum was a source of inspiration for Jeremiah. So I mentioned that uh, for anybody who's interested in the book of Jeremiah, as I am, uh, scholars believe that Nahum was one of Jeremiah's inspirations. So that's pretty, uh, that's pretty cool, pretty interesting. Uh, but Jeremiah 40 verse 7, uh, there's a couple of verses I'm going to read to link to what we're talking about right now out of Jeremiah. And one of them is Jeremiah 48 7. Where Jeremiah says, Because you trust in your works and treasures, you will be captured also. And Chemosh will go into exile with his priests and officials. So Chemosh was the god of Moab. So Jeremiah here is prophesying against Moab what's going to happen to them. And notice he at the beginning of this verse talks about them trusting in their works and their treasures. And we'll read in a little bit about the treasure, the vast treasures of Nineveh. So again, there would be a linkage there. Uh, but we see Kamosh going into exile with his priests and officials. And then Jeremiah 49 verse 3 says, Clothe yourselves with sackcloth and lament. Run back and forth within your walls, because Milcom will go into exile together with his priests and officials. And Milcom is another name for Molech, who is the god of Ammon. So Jeremiah here is prophesying that also Molech will go into exile. So the idea of Ishtar going into exile and Nahum here, Kamosh in uh, Jeremiah 48 and Molech in Jeremiah 49. And the skill of the poet is once again on display in this verse in Nahum. Because the slave girls, it says, are, um, would moan like doves. And the word for doves is the same as the name Jonah. So to the original hearers or readers of Nahum's message, they could not have missed this play on words and would have been reminded of Jonah's ministry in Nineveh and the repentance that ensued from Jonah's ministry. However, this time, neither the people nor the king repent, and so they're taken into exile and their city destroyed. Some also suggest the moaning like doves may be a reference to a Mesopotamian myth in which the dead moan like doves all day, which if that's the case would again be an example of Nahum being familiar with the writings and the religion of Nineveh and, and uh, speaking accordingly or linking his prophecies accordingly. Verse 8, Nineveh has been like a pool of water from her first days, but they are fleeing. Stop, stop, they cry, but no one turns back. Now this, surprisingly, believe it or not, this is the first time Nineveh has been directly named since chapter 1, verse 1. Which is again interesting and shows that uh, something more than simply Nineveh is what Nahum is talking about as he's gone uh, all this time and not actually mentioned Nineveh until right here. But historical Nineveh was known for its deep water reservoirs. The water reservoirs represent Nineveh's power. They had power with plenty in reserve. But Nineveh's waters are now draining away and it collapses like an empty aquifer. As we saw Yahweh in chapter 1, he rebuked the sea and river and they, immediately, and they immediately responded. But here the people cry to the draining waters of Nineveh, but they don't stop or respond. Only Yahweh has control over the storm and chaos. The waters of chaos flee before Yahweh the divine warrior. As we talked before how the scholars link this idea of the flood in uh, Nahum chapter 2 to the primordial waters of the waters of chaos or even the, or the cosmic ocean. So O. Palmer Robertson here, he talks about um, this in the historical setting and he says, quote, throughout the ages it had made it, and he's talking about Nineveh of course, throughout the ages it had made full use of its natural habitat, which makes its disappearance from the face of the earth even more remarkable. Now that the wall has been broken through, the inhabitants panic. Those who had made a career of gleefully pursuing others suddenly discover the terrors of being hunted down themselves. Stand, wait, someone shouts after them. But they dare not lose even the split second it might cost them to cast a glance over their shoulder. The route is total, justice prevails." Quote. And a scholar named Pinker here, he says, 
Quote, it seems that it is neither inundating waters nor receding waters that Nahum describes, but standing water as in a pool, end quote. Now that's very interesting, the idea of, a, of standing water, a pool of water. Because spiritually speaking, water, water throughout the scripture is used um, in a spiritual sense for uh, nourishment, for life. And spiritually speaking, Nineveh, the waters of Nineveh, cannot give life to those who drink from them. A standing water only imparts sickness, disease, and death. And this is the opposite of what the Lord Jesus Christ offers. In John 7, 37, it says, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And in John 4, 14, Jesus says, But whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And the contrast between drinking from the Lord, the, drink, the water the Lord provides, or anything else is described in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, which says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So just as an application point for us, uh, don't drink from the pool of the world. Don't drink from the waters of that the world offers. Drink from the fountain of the living water. And I did a two-part teaching series on this idea of living water and the, um, the spiritual aspects of water throughout the scripture. And those videos are also up on the channel, those teachings. So I encourage you to go check those out if you haven't heard them. So back to Nahum here, chapter 2, verse 9 and 10 says, Plunder the silver, plunder the gold. There is no end to the treasure, an abundance of every precious thing. Desolation, decimation, devastation. Hearts melt, knees tremble, insides churn, every face grows pale. A few scholars have noted and believe that at its peak, Nineveh had more riches than the enormous treasure that would later be accumulated by the Persian Empire. And the wealth of the Persian Empire was legendary. So the fact that these scholars believe that Nineveh at its peak had more riches is quite, is quite amazing. But as, Nah as Nahum here says, there is no end to the treasure. But as we're beginning to see here in chapter 2, and we'll see as Nahum finishes out in chapter 3, there is an end to Nineveh. And Christensen says of verse 10, quote, Perhaps the most striking verse of the entire book of Nahum, the city that was filled with the world's treasure in booty and tribute has become emptiness personified, comparable to the image of Tohu Vabohu of Genesis 1-2, the primeval chaos present before creation itself, end quote. That's quite a statement. And if you remember from the introduction, I mentioned that some scholars believe Nahum coined new words to convey his message with the highest level of poetry. And right here is the occasion for these new coined words. Desolation, decimation, devastation translates three Hebrew words that occur only here. And it's possible that this is another example of Nahum's words being inspired by, an, by the uh, boasts of the Assyrian kings. Because there's an, an Assyrian inscription recording the words of Ashurbanipal as following, quote, that city I devastated, I destroyed, demolished with water, annihilated, end quote. So there in that, uh, in that inscription, what Ashurbanipal, the words he's using there, are very, very similar to what we're reading here in Nahum. That's clearly the same imagery that Nahum is now using against them. So as Assyria did to others, it is now being done to them. And we'll see in the book of Revelation, Mystery Babylon also receives the, receives the same judgment in a very similar statement. In Revelation 18, verse 6, it says, Pay her back as she herself has paid back others, and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. And Robertson here says, quote, The picture pulsates with the reality of the situation. Terror reigns on every side, end quote. So Nahum has here painted a picture of complete human despair when he talks about um, 
The hearts melt, the knees tremble, the insides churn, and every face grows pale. That's a picture of complete human despair. But the last phrase of this um, of this verse, here translated as, quote, every face grows pale, is difficult in the Hebrew scholars' debate, and each have their various views and opinions, and it's actually pretty varied. I mention that in order to bring up my favorite of the suggestions, as one scholar interprets the Hebrew to mean something like, quote, glo uh, glory of the doomed. The glory of the doomed. And that's just cool poetry. And Spronk also connects the word with glory or splendor, suggesting that's, that what's being communicated is the end of the former glory. There's also a linguistic connection here between Nahum and Isaiah. And it involves, this connection involves the day of the Lord or the day of Yahweh. And it's actually the second, it's actually the verses following what I read Isaiah 13 earlier. I read verse 3 through 5, but the connection of Isaiah to Nahum is in verse 6 through 8. And in Isaiah it says, Wail, for the day of Yahweh is near. As destruction from the Almighty it will come. Therefore all hands will be feeble and every human heart will melt. They will be dismayed. Pangs and agony will seize them. They will be in anguish like a woman in labor. They will look aghast at one another. Their faces will be aflame. So that's Isaiah. And so the connection there between Nahum and the day of Yahweh prophecies, which find their ultimate fulfillment at the eschaton, is further proof, if even more proof is needed, as I've been trying to point out and, um, and have over and over again that Nahum's message is much more than simply historical. So when you tie the language of Nahum and his, destruct, and his um, prophecies of destruction against Ishtar and Nineveh, when you tie those linguistically with Isaiah's prophecies of the day of the Lord, it's, it's undeniable at that point that Nahum is uh, more than historical, more than past history. So verse 11 and 12, Nahum chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, Where is the lion's lair, or the feeding ground of the young lions, where the lion and lioness prowled, and the lion's cub, with nothing to frighten them away? The lion mauled whatever its cubs needed, and strangled prey for its lionesses. It filled up its dens with the kill, and its lairs with mauled prey. The word in verse 11, translated as lair, the lion's lair, that word is used of Yahweh's dwelling in Deuteronomy 26, verse 15, Jeremiah 25, verse 30, and Psalm 68, verse 6. So the use of this term in these three verses I just mentioned, as well as here in Nahum, implies a contest between Yahweh and the, quote, lion of Assyria. And Christensen says, quote, the, the image of the lion also carries overtones of supernatural conflict, for Ishtar was often portrayed mounted on the back of a lion or even as a lioness herself. The same is true of the Canaanite goddess Asherah, who is represented standing on a lion in numerous Egyptian stelae. The monstrous enemy of God in creation is sometimes depicted as a voracious lion, and in New Testament tradition the devil is described as a roaring lion. The dreaded lion of Assyria is now becoming the prey to the more powerful lion of Judah, end quote. And when describing the behavior of these lions, the Hebrew again uses words that when read out loud make us sound like growling. So when I mentioned before that the, that the language, the, the terminology uh, in the section about the empty ears emptying, when read out loud, makes the sound like a, the gurgling of liquid being poured out of a uh, out of a vessel, out of a container. So the language here, the same, a similar thing is happening here. That when this is read out loud, it sounds like a growling sound. So it, it remin it's reminiscent of the sound the lions make. Uh, it's describing a lion, and when it's read out loud, it actually sounds like growling. So that's again the skill of the poet. And it's the normalization of violence that's really what's being depicted here. And if you remember, in Jonah chapter 3, the king of Nineveh called for the citizens to forsake their violence. But now they are embracing and glorifying violence. And we could easily see our own culture here as well. 
Robertson says here, quote, Torture and inhumanity of the worst sort were a major characteristic of royal life. For 200 years they ravaged the various peoples of the ancient Near East, just as lions prowl daily for their prey. But Nineveh has one adversary that it cannot so easily manhandle, end quote. And the Assyrian kings portrayed themselves as lions in battle. So just as we mentioned, the, the Assyrian kings talked about themselves as floods. Um, and then Nahum used flood language to describe their destruction. The same things happens here with the lions. As the Assyrian kings portrayed themselves as lions in battle and also as great lion killers. And the Assyrian kings Adad and II and also Asher Nasser Paul are quoted as saying, I am lion brave. And Sennacherib is quoted as saying, like a lion I raged. But the lion of Judah is far superior and will, and will devour the great lion of Assyria. It's also been suggested here by the scholars that the lion represents the king, the lioness, the queen, the young lions, the army, and the lion's cubs, the general population. So while there's supernatural, uh, strong supernatural overtones of the lion and lioness, which we're going to look at here in a second, they also uh, are representative of the human uh, agents that are involved in historical Assyria. And Watts here says, quote, The figure of the lion is particularly good for the overtones of supernatural conflict in the book. Ishtar was often pictured mounted on a lion's back or even herself as a lioness, end quote. And so, as Christensen before referenced the verse, but he didn't quote it, I'm going to read it here, and it's 1 Peter 5, 8. It says, Your adversary the devil is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. And interestingly, there was a lioness deity worshipped in the second half of the 2nd century BC in Ugarit in southwest Canaan. And this war goddess was the patroness of chariot warriors. And we also, as we looked at, we saw um, earlier in this chapter of Nahum, the idea of chariot warriors. Uh, so this war goddess was the patroness of chariot warriors and is also associated with lions. And in Mesopotamia later, this goddess is Ishtar. So by the time of uh, Nahum, this lioness deity uh, was Ishtar. And the, li the lioness symbolizes the military character of Ishtar. And Theodore J. Lewis, in his article, I'm going to give you the article title here, and it's, um, it's CT 13.33-34 and Ezekiel 32, Lion Dragon Myths. So that's the title of this article by Theodore J. Lewis. And in that article, he says, quote, Ishtar is the deity most frequently associated with the lion. Labatu, lioness, occurs as her epithet alone. She is the lioness among the Ajiji. She, she drives seven lions in her war chariot. These seven lions are called the symbol of her divinity. Her iconography shows her seated on a lion throne and standing or treading upon the lion, end quote. And uh, he said there that, um, that Ishtar is the lioness among the Ajiji, and the Ajiji were a group of Mesopotamian gods. So that's what, that's what that means, and that's what that is that he's quoting there. And there's also an interesting verse in 2 Samuel 23.20. In which Beniah, one of David's mighty men, is said to have killed two, quote, Ariels of Moab. And scholars aren't sure what this means. The King James translates it as two lion like men of Moab. The ESV just transliterates the word and says that he killed two Ariels of Moab. The literal translation would be something like a lions of God. And there's an, interest, there's an entry in the Dictionary of Deities and Demons on this word, Ariels. And they say in part, quote, Ariel here designates some kind of person, be it a warrior or a mythic figure, end quote. And then they go on, and I'm just going to summarize the rest of, uh, paraphrase it a bit here. Uh, there was a bronze silver figure found in the Transjordan. And I believe that that discovery was in the early to mid-90s, but I'm not 100% sure on that. But this figure, according to the excavator, represents a male lion-faced warrior, possibly a warrior god. 
there's an inscription known as the Misha inscription. And one of the lines on this inscription could be translated, quote, the lion figure of their beloved God, according to scholar J.C.L. Gibson. And Ninurta, who is another of the Mesopotamian deities, who, by the way, rode on a chimera beast that had the body of a lion and the tail of a scorpion. So if that sounds like uh, Book of Revelation imagery to you, it sure does to me. Uh, but Ninurta is said in one of the texts to have taken on the features of the exceedingly mighty lion-headed one of Enlil. So I say all that, I go through those things about the lion gods and goddesses. Um, I say all that in order to say that these verses about lions and lionesses very well could be pronouncements of doom by Yahweh upon these rebel gods. And I do think that's what's being communicated here by Nahum. So verse 13, the final verse for today, says, Beware, I am against you. This is the declaration of Yahweh of armies. I will make your chariots go up in smoke, and the sword will devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the sound of your messengers will never be heard again. So our standing before God is what determines everything. And this would be a homiletic interpretation for us here uh, that Dwayne Christensen points out. He's, he's the one who, who pointed this out that I'm going to expand on a little bit. He says our standing before God is what determines everything. And Jesus promised to be with us always even to the end, to, even to the end of the age. And throughout the Gospels to his own, to his disciples, Jesus says, Fear not. But when those who hated him came to arrest him, he didn't tell them to fear not. He didn't say that to them. So here in Nahum, we see what God, what Yahweh says to those who stand in opposition to him. They hear the words, behold, I am against you. And as we saw in Revelation 19, that um, when all the armies of those who hate the Lord, who hate Jesus, are gathered together. When he comes, he comes against them, uh, backed by the armies of heaven. Not that he needs any help, because he's the only one that, that actually does anything uh, when he returns, but at least as far as the, the war goes. But um, those who stand in opposition hear the words, Behold, I am against you. So it's, it's up to free will. It's up to our choice if we're going to Come to the Lord in faith and repentance, and he will, of course, always forgive and accept us, and then we hear fear not. If we refuse and we hate him and we try to fight him, then we get the, uh, behold, I am against you. So here in Nahum, God has now set himself against the tyrant. And Robertson says here, quote, The Almighty stands so appalled at the atrocities committed by the kings of Nineveh that he declares that he himself shall war against them, end quote. And the statement of the Lord here of Yahweh was, I am against you, declares Yahweh who commands the armies of heaven. So when it says Yahweh of armies or Yahweh of hosts, that is the armies of heaven and he is their commander. So Jeremiah, another tie-in with Nahum, and Jeremiah, Jeremiah uses similar language to describe the fall of Babylon. In Jeremiah 50, verse 31, Jeremiah says, it says, Look, and this is the Lord speaking through Jeremiah, it says, Look, I am against you, you arrogant one. This is the declaration of the Lord Yahweh of armies. Your day, for your day has come, the time when I will punish you. So scholars, some scholars point out here that the way that the, the language is communicated, it's as if uh, the, the kings of Assyria and their gods have issued a challenge to Yahweh. And here we read that Yahweh has accepted the challenge. He has called out his opponent for the final battle. So it's commander versus commander. As we saw the, uh, earlier in chapter 2, the, the scatterer and then the commander of the forces inside of of Nineveh that Nahum was describing. So that would be Nineveh historically, uh, Belial versus Yahweh, and then later the book of Revelation, it's the beast versus Jesus Christ, and these are the same, the same ideas. The armies of heaven 
are represented as well by the phrase Yahweh of hosts or the armies of heaven as I mentioned. So both human and divine forces are at work adding another cosmic dimension to the war with Nineveh and also another linkage with the book of Revelation. So as we see here, as Yahweh is coming against them, coming against Nineveh here, coming against Ishtar, coming against these gods that claim to be lions or these human kings that claim to be lions. Um, he says, I will make your chariots go up in smoke and the sword will devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth and the sound of your messengers will never be heard again. So the lion hunter is now the hunted lion. He's cut off and silenced. And this links back to chapter 1 verse 15. So while Nineveh's messengers are silenced, the messengers of the gospel of peace are sent out. And that's what we saw in chapter 1 verse 15. So this brings us to the end of chapter 2. And that's all we're going to do for today. We'll start chapter 3 next time. So let's close in a quick word of prayer. Father God, we thank, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for the detail that it contains. Lord, how it, the thread just weaves through from the book of Re the book of Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation. How Nahum was an influence for Jeremiah, who was also an influence for John in the book of Revelation. God, just how intricate and how skilled the the men that you called to write your word were, and how your Holy Spirit influenced and inspired them to communicate the truth for us today and I would ask that you would open our hearts and minds to understand your word to understand the love that you have for us that your desire is for everybody to come to repentance so that Lord no, nobody is it stands against you as your enemies because you don't want that. You want us all to come. You want all humanity to come, even though we know they won't, but you still, that's your heart. So I just pray that you would soften hearts and minds, Lord, in these days to accept your word, to accept your truth, Lord, to come to you in repentance and knowing the greatness of your love and your desire. Lord, we thank you for everything that you've done. We thank you for what you are doing and what you will do. God, we praise you in Jesus' name.